Thank you. Each year at the Ethical Society, we organize our programs around a theme. Our theme this year is building an ethical future. In September, we're exploring the future, November. In November, we are exploring the future of humanism. To speak to that theme, it is now my pleasure to induce, introduce Lori Grun, who is a leading scholar in animal studies and feminist philosophy. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am excited to be here and explore the future of humanism by moving beyond um, humanism, as it were, or at least moving beyond the human. Um, I am an ethics professor and I teach about the relationships between humans and the more than human world. And today I'd like to talk to you about the ways in which um, we can begin to repair some divides amongst um, humans and also other animals by sharing with you my view that I call entangled empathy. Um, and so I'm going to try to share my screen. Um, and hopefully that will work. Um, I don't actually, let's see if I can, let me see if the, if I share this, can you see it? How do I know? Hmm. Interesting question. Are you able to see? I don't, I don't currently see anything. I just see you. Oh. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Um, let me, uh, see if I can, yes, it is, hold on one second, it's possible, um, it's not showing me a, uh, it's not showing me what I can show you, which is unfortunate, I made you a PowerPoint, so, um, hmm. that's too bad. Well, um, I can certainly talk through the thoughts. I, I did have some really lovely pictures. Um, I think it would have been more interesting to have been able to show you the, the PowerPoint. Uh, but let me talk a little bit about the human and animal divide. Um, the human and animal divide in many ways has been the under pinning of a lot of divide amongst humans. I don't want to go into too much detail here, but I think all you will need to think about in order to, to recognize the way in which the human animal divide also divides us as humans is to think about how people denigrate others by calling them animals. Part of that is a value system that puts animals below um, humans. And in animal ethics, the area that I've been working in for a number of years and that work has been going on for about 50 years, there have been two trends. One trend is to recognize that other animals are like us. Uh, they experience pain and pleasure like we do. And if we want to do better in the world, we want to minimize pain. That's a particular view that gets goes dates back to Jeremy Bentham um, and in more current times is associated with uh, prominent and controversial philosopher Peter Singer. There's another view that tries to recognize not just sentience or the ability to experience pain and pleasure, but uh, to be able to um, value experiences. And that tends to be what we think of as the rights view. Now, these views traditionally focus on similarities between humans and non-humans. I had a gorgeous little slide for you with a picture of a, a chimpanzee friend of mine, which I'm sorry I can't show you. Uh, but essentially, one of the things that um, we recognize as similar between humans and other animals is tool use. Um, and in the photos that I had on the slide, Emma was using a wrench to try to fix a hydraulic system. Um, I, 
there's also a very clear sense in which other animals manipulate their environments. They solve problems like we do, both physical problems and social problems. They use symbols, at least some animals are taught to use symbols, and that can range from chimpanzees to dolphins to sea lions. Um, even dogs can be uh, taught to use symbols. Some actually use and understand language. They're emotional beings. Some of the animals will respond to injustice and they'll respond to betrayal. And they're very like us in what we might call morally salient ways. They feel things, they grieve, um, they're curious, they love others, um, and their lives can go better or worse for them. And that insight that their lives can go better or worse for them um, is an important pillar of animal ethics. Um, but I have some worries about the traditional approaches to animal ethics. These two that I just mentioned, both the sentientious view and what you might call the rights-based view. One of the things that worries me about these traditional approaches is it overlooks what matters from the animal's point of view. In some ways, it, it projects onto others what humans care about. And so human capacities remain at the center. And there, are, in keeping humans at the center, there are two issues that worry me. One is that their, the unique capacities that other animals have get assimilated into our view. And the other is that we're still thinking about individuals and their capacities rather than our relationships, both with each other and other animals. And so I developed a view, an alternative view, that I call entangled empathy. And I wanted to share with you um, some of the thoughts uh, that lie behind the view of entangled empathy. Central is this notion that we're already in ethical relationships to other animals. We might not attend to them, but we're in those relationships. And because we're in those relationships, just as we're in other relationships with humans, we can make these relationships better. And indeed, I often say, no one, I hope, would stand behind or endorse the view that they're in a bad relationship and they're gonna keep it bad. We want to make our relationships with one another, with other humans better, and we want to make our relationships with other animals better, or we should want to make any relationship we're in better. And one of the ways we can do that is by understanding the other. And understanding the other, um, can be done through a process that I call entangled empathy. Now, there's a variety of different kinds of empathy. So before I describe what I mean by entangled empathy, I wanna talk about the various views that exist about empathy because it can be very confusing. I know you all talk about empathy. Empathy is such an important um, capacity experience, I think of it as a process, and I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, but there's other ways in which psychologists and humanists and ethicists have all thought about empathy. And I wanna distinguish entangled empathy from some of these other empathetic views. I'm not saying these other empathetic views are wrong or problematic. I just wanna suggest that the view of entangled empathy is markedly different than some of the other theories of empathy that we might have. So one of the, um, kinds of empathy we might talk about is to be able to put yourself in the shoes of another, um, to understand her emotions and her feelings, to form a kind of inner imitation or simulation, if you will. Of course, animals don't wear shoes, and so this doesn't quite apply. We'd have to stretch it a little bit. Um, another way of thinking about empathy is that it's a form of inference, a type of psychological inference where there's um, observations and memory and knowledge and reasoning. Um, and all of this happens um, to produce insights into the thoughts and feelings of others. So it's not just an experiential or an effective or a feeling state that we're engaged in, we might be engaged in reasoning. Um, so it's a psychological inference. We're trying to figure out what another person or another animal is feeling 
Um, and that will give us insights and understanding into their thoughts and feelings. And then um, there's an other oriented emotional response that is meant to be end oriented. That is, we, we want to try to improve the well being or the welfare of the other. So some people think of empathy in ways that are not unlike sympathy. Um, but entangled empathy, the view that I have and have been developing, um, is uh, I'm going to define it uh, in this way. And I do this in my little book, Entangled Empathy. It's a type of caring perception focused on attending to another's experience of well being. And it's an experiential process that involves both emotion and cognition in which we recognize that we're in these relationships with others and we're called upon to be both responsive and responsible in these relationships by attending to the other's interests, desires, vulnerabilities, hopes, sensitivities, and so on. So let me say a little bit more about um, entangled empathy and um, what I, I hope it helps us to understand. Um, so one of the things that's central about um, entangled empathy is that it encourages a type of uh, empathetic perception. So what we're trying to do is develop uh, and cultivate um, empathetic perception. So how do we do that? So entangled empathy suggests that we need to attend the particularities. We need to, as was so beautifully spoken about a moment ago, observe this mother with her three in her infant on her chest and her toddler children, um, attend to those particulars um, and appreciate those particulars. Now, sometimes it's going to be graceful, as we heard. Uh, sometimes it's going to be quite difficult. Um, I use an example in Entangled Empathy, the book, about uh, being on a subway and a uh, individual, a man, has his two children and they're running around like wild kids on the subway, very dis disturbing other people who are trying to read, who are trying to just um, you know, relax after work. And we might think, well, this, this father is not being particularly graceful in his caring for his children. He's not being very attentive to the other people on the subway. But then if we pay attention to the particulars, if we don't make judgments or generalize, he's just being a absent father or something like that. And we learn that he's returning from a funeral in which his partner died. Um, we have a very different way of empathetically attending to the particulars of that situation. And we wouldn't be able to respond and be responsible in our response to him if we weren't attending to those particulars. So before we make judgments, entangled empathy encourages us to try to learn about what the situation is that another's experiencing. And that involves perspective taking as well. So we need to try in addition to paying attention to particulars, we need to take the perspective of another insofar as we can. And that may, in the context of other animals, involve trying to understand how they exist in their worlds. And their worlds are very different. And again, I'm very sorry that the um, slides aren't working because I had some lovely slides of chimpanzees, but also slides of domesticated animals, cows and sheep and chickens. Um, and to try to understand the experiences that they have um, in the systems of denigration and exploitation um, that we humans have created in this divide between us and them. We use other animals in ways that are um, profoundly um, de-animalizing is one way we could put it. And so it's very difficult to understand what they might feel or experience when they're in our, um, when they're our captives. And so one of the ways that we can develop and cultivate empathetic perspectives um, and take better perspective on 
other animals is not to imagine that their lives are just what their lives are in our captive control, but also to attend to natural observations. Now, we can't, of course, be the out in the wild observing, you know, jungle fowl, the, uh, what chickens used to be. Um, that's not what I was suggesting. But we can actually learn a lot about how other animals um, value their lives, value their relationships by attending to both natural observations, but also the expertise and insights of those who spend their lives watching other animals. Another part of entangled empathy that I wanted to highlight is that of um, the focus on flourishing um, or well-being. So this is another part of um, empathetic concern and empathetic perception that we are interested in ultimately attending to the flourishing of others, the flourishing of other humans and the flourishing of other animals. And when we recognize that our relationships to other animals um, reflect back on us and our agency and our ethical attention to the relationships that we're in, both near and far, um, we're in a much better position to sort of, if, if I can borrow your language, be our best selves. We can, in, we can improve those relationships. Um, and I think that one of the ways of thinking about the future of, of humanism is to recognize that the divide between the human and the non-human um, is one that is the source of many of our problems with one another, and certainly the source of a lot of pain and suffering for other animals. And so I'll end by just mentioning that our theoretical commitments, our practical commitments, our ethical commitments have important impacts, not only on how we understand uh, various institutions and human practices, but also on our very ways of understanding ourselves and our relationships. And as I said at the outset, one of the important concerns that I'm interested in um, helping to share through entangled empathy is that we're in these relationships, whether or not we're wittingly involved. So um, one way in which thinking about our consumption patterns, um, I've recently been teaching about orangutans and their plight in Borneo and Sumatra and Malaysia. Um, orangutans are ex becoming extinct because of the decimation of their forests and their habitats um, in favor of the production of monocrops, uh, palm oil plantations. Those monocrops, those palm oil plantations are decimating not just orangutans, but many of the unique and wonderful forest dwellers in Indonesia and Malaysia, but they're also harming the native people in Indonesia and Malaysia for the profit of multinational corporations from offshore. All of us are implicated, not directly, but indirectly in the use of palm oil because it's ubiquitous. It's in shampoos and soaps and foods and candies. It's pretty much anywhere. Um, it's almost impossible for us to not be implicated in the destruction of the native people and the native animals in Indonesia because of the palm oil industry. That's a relationship. It's a relationship that's attenuated. It's a relationship that's stretched, but it is one that we're entangled in. And because we're entangled in that relationship, we ought to be attending to it. Because of course, if our actions because through practices and institutions that we don't control. But if our practices and our behaviors have that kind of impact on our relationships that make them damaging, that's something for us to ethically attend to. And entangled empathy is one way that we can do that. Thank you.